Right, the two-part ESPN documentary, the 30 for 30 on Lance Armstrong has started. The first part was out this week. The second part is out next week. And I'm delighted to say we've got former Lance Armstrong teammate, Tyler Hamilton, with us to talk about the documentary and, and really what you made so far of, of this story. First off, Tyler, I, I, we didn't even ask this, but have you actually watched the first part? Have you, have you seen, did they show you the second part, the whole thing as a, as a participant? Or how has your relationship been with this movie? Um, yeah, no, I just watched the first part last night, like you. Yeah, I haven't seen the second part yet. Uh, yeah, I thought the first part was interesting. You know, I didn't, there's some things that, you know, I'd known Lance for a long time. You know, we were teammates for, what, four years. And um, there, yeah, there were some things that I didn't know about him. So I, I learned a little bit about, you know, his, his childhood. And, you know, it wasn't... What were you learning? You know, he had a pretty rough childhood, you know, or, you know sweet sweet mom you know i've met her before uh i think it's linda uh but you know we, yeah really without a fatherly figure for a little while there and then his, his stepdad uh i can't remember his name but just he was a bit tough on lance and you know um some of his actions maybe you know um lance kind of took in took under his belt as well so to speak you know uh He's a little bit, he beat, beat up on, he beat Lance and, you know, I didn't like to hear that, but, you know, maybe some of his anger kind of was spurred on by, I think it was Terry Armstrong. I think his mm. stepfather was Terry. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm still waking up. It's early here in Montana. I no, guess that's it's good. And now it's the middle of the afternoon here where, where we are, but um, Terry did not seem like a very nice man at all. Kind of seemed to be reveling in the fact that he, had such an impact on Lance. I drove him like an animal was one of the yeah. lines he used about him, which was, that was probably my, that was probably my least favorite line of the whole program last night. Yeah. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. But, um, but it, it shows you a little bit of, you know, where he came from his past and, and maybe, you know, maybe gives you a little bit more empathy towards what he went through. I don't know. I don't know. You know, it'll be interesting to see the second part and, and then kind of take a step back. Sometimes it takes me a few days to kind of let things sink in. But yeah, you know, I mean, he's had a wild ride. He's had a wild ride. That's for sure. And, you know, his early years were certainly tough. You know, I'd say tougher than mine growing up. Yeah. Yep. I, I guess, Tyler, one of the things that the whole world is, is really interested in at the moment is um, this is airing on a Sunday night on ESPN. The same slot aired the Michael Jordan documentary, and in this, Lance compares himself to, you know, his, my contemporaries now would be LeBron James. It would be Phelps, and so it's fair to compare him a little bit, Jordan. And I think there's actually quite a lot of comparison between the two of them. I'm just not sure this documentary has brought that out just yet. He he seems like you know, a good parent bringing his daughter in the place and a kind son and a reasonable teammate. There's been none of the, the characteristic bullying that, you know, we would have seen with Michael Jordan, for example, that we know is there with Lance. I, I felt that bit was missing. The, the villain of Lance has not yet to emerge from, from this documentary. Is the, does the, is, is the villain a real you know, thing? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the documentary ended... I mean, it'll be interesting to see what comes in the second part. For sure, for sure. I mean, it's um, obviously, yeah. I learned a bunch in the in the for this first episode on his, you know, his upbringing, you know, childhood and those early teen years, you know. But um, but yeah, there's still a lot left to be said, and you know, there's some. I mean, I'm waiting for the dark stuff. You know, that's for sure. There was some, there was some dark stuff, you know, with, with me, with with him, with many many people. Yeah. It'll be interesting. We'll see. So, but, uh, you know, maybe we'll have to talk again in a few weeks. But we, we might have to, Tyler, actually, because I definitely feel after watching it for the first time, it's almost like it's not about the bike, but adapted for screen. It, it is very much the autobiography of, of Lance Armstrong coming out here for a lot of it, that there seems to be a lot of key things that are touched on here and there, like, I hope we see a bit more about his relationship with Michele Ferrari because in episode one, it's kind of glossed over. I don't think if you're coming to the Lance Armstrong story for the first time, you fully appreciate just how important this doctor is and the success of, of Lance Armstrong. 
And yeah. also a couple of other things that I'm just interested in, the, the very early stages of Lance Armstrong delving into the world of doping. He, he says 1993 is when he started around the age of 21. Cortisone uh, was the drug of choice, dabbling uh, in and around that. And it, it's hard to get a sense of if he has challenged on whether or not he doped before 1993. What was your sense on that, that when you heard that last night, that, right, that makes sense? Or hmm, I'm not so sure about that. Um, yeah, so when he was 21, was that 1993? Yeah, according to Lance, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that was well before my time, so, you know, I got to take, I would, I would assume that he won the world championships with, you know, not, not on bread and water. So, so yeah, I, was just, I assume doping was part, kind of part of that. Um, I don't know if there was anything I had it before, before then, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, that was kind of, I was kind of climbing the amateur ranks at that point, so. But yeah, I mean, it's it was uh, doping at that time was prevalent in the in the at the at the elite level of cycling. That's for sure. Because he mentions the that this, this question has kind of come up when this documentary was being promoted. That Lance is not going to deny the possibility that the drugs he was taking may have accelerated cancer growth, and it is all pie in the sky stuff. It's speculation. But the fact that he was using HGH. Was that normal for people in the 90s? Granted, it is, as you say, a bit before your time, but had you heard stories? It, was that a normal situation for a cyclist to be taking growth hormone in the, in the 1990s? You know, again, that was kind of before my time, so I'm not sure, you know, uh, do, uh, growth hormone, you know, I tried it once in my career, maybe in 1998 for a week or two. And yeah, it's, uh, some people really, excelled on it other people's not so much i don't know i didn't like it so i didn't really take it again um but i, I assume yeah back in the earlier 90s yeah i was probably being introduced to riders i'm sure it was a part of their you know arsenal yeah yeah you know growth hormone testosterone uh cortisone yeah you know, and once you got introduced to it, you know, the big, you know, as Lance called it, you know, or I don't know if you call it a game changer, but it's, EPO is a game changer drug, you know. And once you kind of got on that program, you know, you, I, my first doping product was uh, a team doctor handed me a little red egg shaped capsule. It was a testosterone pill. Um, you know, I felt uh, three days later when I did my next bike race, I felt a little bit more recovered after I had just done a really hard stage race. Um, but you know, EPO was like a whole nother level. Like, you know, after a few weeks of taking EPO, you could really feel a difference much more significant than a, um, than a testosterone, small testosterone pill. Yeah. It, it definitely feels to me, it's either that it is in Lance's interest to try and preserve as clean an image as he possibly can when it comes to the early to mid nineties, right? Because at least if he can do that, he can try to project the image that, hey, everybody was doping. I was just doping better than everybody, or I had the most natural talent because I was clean coming up to the 90s and everybody was doing EPO. Everybody was doing blood bags when I was at my peak, but I was actually coming from the highest base because I was more talented than everybody else in the peloton. That's certainly my take on it. I'm, I'm not sure yeah. what you think. Yeah. You know, we'll never really know, really. Because, you know, once you start doping, the minute you start doping, like, you never know. Like, it's impossible to know, you know, who was really the best, for sure. So, you know, I've kind of conceded to that. Like, you know, the minute I took that red testosterone pill in the spring of 1997, I could never really say, oh, you know, I deserve this result or I deserve that result, you know, regardless if I was doping or not. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe he's trying to, you know, control the narrative a little bit, you know, but that's that's kind of Lance Armstrong's MO. It's all it's always been that way. You know, definitely likes being in, in control. But yeah, you know, once you start doping, you'll never know where who is the best. It, it, it's it's not all equal. And even if you both take ex you're equally talented riders, the same level, you take exactly the same you know, performance enhancing drug, you know, people respond differently to performance enhancing drugs, to all medication. So, um, yeah, it's sad, but yeah, we'll never know who's the best in that area. That's why, 
it's really interesting to hear you talk about the HGH taking that for a week and it, it not really agreeing with you or, or not being something that you wanted to go with. Um, in in the documentary last night, you you look like such a young, fresh faced teammate in in ninety nine. It's like oh, we had this young guy, and uh, when you when you see that. What was your first thought when you saw that in the documentary when you when the camera panned across and they were doing the list of teammates and it cut to you? What did you think? Yeah, it kind of broke my heart a little bit. It was just like, God, we were all so young. We were all so young and kind of pliable and like, you know, I wouldn't say duped. We weren't duped into it. I think we all knew what we were getting into, but you know, climbing the ranks and the amateur ranks and then in the lower professional ranks, like I had no idea what I was getting into and then boom. You know, you arrive on this on this team, and um, yeah, things change really quickly. And you know, we were young and wide-eyed, and you know, I think maybe a little bit, you know, easy to easy to convince to you know maybe cross into the into that gray zone. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, you know, they say every cell in your body changes every seven years. So you know, I'm okay couple lifetimes away from all that I feel like but yeah you know it makes me sad that yeah we were a, a you know a um just a young young team yeah and um I don't know I don't know I don't know if we had any idea of what we were getting ourselves into really you know really just taking it again day by day because Bernil says that you guys were quite surprised to be, and maybe it wasn't Bernil who said it, but certainly Bernil was given the impression that you guys weren't particularly ready to be the most dominant team in the race, oh, yeah. and um, and yeah, and so it kind of comes as a bit of a surprise to him. Certainly, did you guys know how good that team was and how dominant that team was going to become straight away? When did you begin to feel yeah. that? Yeah, no, I don't think we knew how good we were <clears throat> really until. We kind of got into the race, really. Um, I mean, people, everybody was saying, yeah, Lance was strong, but he had a really, he had a, a weak team behind him. Um, so I think as soon as he took yellow, I think it was on stage eight there, the 99 tour, he won that time trailer. So he established himself as a, the, you know, at that point he was, you know, the strongest contender after stage eight. and. You know, we, we all really had to step up, all as teammates, and um, you know, lead on the flats and lead in the mountains. And yeah, I think we surprised ourselves a bit. I and mean, we were still the kind of the bad news bears of that level of cycling. You know, we do we uh, we we made it in norm. We didn't have to get in it as a wild card team, but we were. You know, there are plenty of teams with much bigger budgets than ours. We had a couple rented campers, and um, yeah. Sort of the bad news bears, I, I would say. So you know, those years were a little bit different, maybe a little bit more exciting because there was a lot of unknown. And um, yeah, we had never been in that position before. None of us, none of us. And I think there were seven. I think seven, seven Americans on the team. So it was kind of neat. That was kind of neat. Yeah. But there was the, you know, there was the behind the scenes stuff, and you know, we can't forget that. Well, exactly, and I'm, I'm interested in, in how that dynamic actually works. Like, so, as as a young domestique at that point, is it? How how do you feel? How do you tally with the the EPO that's happening during the race, and and the fact that it's also so exciting? Because you you've made this decision a couple of years ago, and you've come to terms, I, I guess, yeah. with the fact that this is going to happen, and now it's beginning to work. It's starting to pay off. So is it just pure excitement? Is it is there a conflict? And does anybody talk about that in the team room? Does anybody bring it up to Lance at any point? What's that like? Um, you know, if there's conflict, you keep it to yourself. You know, if you're, I kept that to myself. There was, for, I can't speak for everybody else, but there was, yeah. I was conflicted about it, but I had, but like you said, a couple of years before I decided, okay, this is what I have to do. But, I did think about it a lot. It, it would wake me up at night thinking about the consequences if I did get caught. And eventually I did. But yeah, so, but you'd have to, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, you're in, in, in the middle of this crazy competition and you just had to, 
kind of do what you're or, or what was expected of you um and any kind of conflicts like that you just put in the just bury it bury it bury it you know and uh you know that you you know that takes its toll eventually you know maybe not in the tour because it's going it's 150 miles an hour the whole time for three weeks just you know, whether you're on the bike or off the bike, it's so busy. You don't really have time, too, too much time to really think, you know, luckily, luckily, especially for me, I'm kind of a thinker. But yeah, you know, we were doing, yeah, there was a uh, secret, you know, EPO drop offs, you know, we probably got, I don't know, three or four shots of EPO during that tour. You know, not a ton of it, but just a little to kind of keep your levels at least level. Cause in the Tour de France, you start with a hematocrit of say 45, and every week it go, it, it'll drop two points, your hematocrit. You know, your hematocrit's the, the amount of red blood cells you have in your, your body. The more red blood cells you have, the more oxygen you can get to your muscles. So EPO is a game changer for sure. But yeah, we were, um, you know, we were, you know, at the time we were doing what we thought other teams were doing anyways. So we were like, we got to keep up. You know, that was our mentality. Uh, who knows if it was the truth, but. You know, as we, as we saw the year before, the, in 1998, the Festina affair happened, and, you know. We know certainly we weren't the only team, you know, dabbling in the salsa. It was, it was pretty, doping and cyphering at that point was pretty rampant, yeah. So, yeah, it was still obviously very wrong, and, you know, but at that time it was like, okay, this is where we are, like, this is the, Battle we have to fight. Let's just roll up our sleeves and get to it. You know. What would have happened, Tyler? I wonder, do you ever think about this? What What would have happened had you not buried that stuff deep within you? Had you actually brought up the moral question of doping to Lance himself? Um, I mean, I probably would have stayed on the team, but I would not have been invited to that tour. You know, they only back then they had nine riders per tour team, and yeah, you know, twenty five riders per team. So I just select somebody else. Yeah, they yeah, ought have been blackballed for sure, for sure. You know, I got blackballed for, you know, saying the wrong thing to the press sometimes. So yeah, oh yeah, that was part of the, that, that happened plenty. Early on, I, I, even if you're just doing a, a random press conference, you have to be careful about what you're saying for fear that you might end up getting blackballed, as in, you know, not looked after the way everybody else is being looked after. Yeah, you got to be careful with your your words, you know, whether it's at a press, press conference or just do a, you know, cycling publication or any, any kind of publication. Be careful of what you say, you know. Yeah. And what would the repercussions be? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, you didn't want to cross Lance if, if he didn't agree with your wording or if, it, if, if, it, if he read it a different way, you know, that was, um, that could spell trouble for you. So uh, I remember that happening once for me, you know. And what was the outcome? Um, I think I had to apologize to him and then Johan Bernier and Really, I had my tail between my legs. The day I was going to the tour, I almost did. I found out I might not even go because of something I said in the press, you know. But that's all right. I'm not, yeah. It's water under the bridge, you know. It's just part of it. But yeah, they wanted a committed team and they were just making sure I was committed, I guess. But I had always been committed to, to Lance. You know, I helped Lance win his first three tours and I was committed the whole time. But once I, once I decided to, to um, that was enough, and yeah, I kind of shut that door and moved on. That's that's exactly how bullying works, though, isn't it? You you humiliate somebody, you you assert where my, the power lies. We have the power here, and you threaten to withhold stuff. And then when the humiliation is is over, it's like okay, you you can have that thing now that you actually fully deserve because of your talent and your hard work and, and your commitment to the program. Yeah, I mean, I thought I, I, thought I worked hard dur during my three years, you know, helping him win the tour. I, 
I worked my tail off. You know, I, at the time, I would have taken a bullet for the guy. I would have. I would have. I was fully committed. Um, but then I got to a point where I was starting to, I think it was the 2001 season. I was starting to not enjoy it anymore. You know, we won our third tour and it was, a, I was a bit numb to it, you know? And, um, you know, it was during that tour that year that I actually signed a contract to move on and go to another team. So I felt like it, uh, that relationship kind of had kind of run its course. For the most part, I was still hoping to kind of stay friendly, like, but you know, it was time to move on. I had a question about the hermetocrit levels. Were you as obsessive about the hermetocrit levels during the tour as Lance obviously becomes later on? Did you have access to all the data that Michele Ferrari was providing, and how scientific did that get at the start, or was that kind of look? These are guidelines. You need to do this. It's going to be where the the deep dive into that information come um during the tour i wasn't really so concerned about my hematocrit i mean before the tour i was concerned about my hematocrit you wanted to show up to the tour with a, a pretty solid hematocrit you had three weeks of racing you knew your hematocrit is going to probably drop like six points in, in the, uh, three weeks so you didn't want to arrive too low that's for sure but you also didn't want to arrive too high either that's you know set off the uh, kind of the alarm bells. But once the tour got going, your hematocrits, your hematocrit, you know, you know, back in uh, what, the year 2000, then 2002, 2003, 2004, yeah, then during the tour you had, you know, you received a, a transfusion. So that also helped. And to, you know, the transfusion can bump your hematocrit up, what, like two to three point, two and a half to three points. Yep, so that was significant. Everybody got this, or Lance got more than everybody else. How did that work? What was that? I can only just speak for myself. You know, I got one in 2000 with uh, Lance and a teammate. Um, then I didn't do it in 2001. I did it again in 2002 with a different team. Yep, it was a lot of team leaders did transfusions. Uh, some of the domestiques did. You know, we've heard some of the news come out. You know, I think later on Postal, I think most of the team did it a couple of years later, but. You know, that was sort of what you were expected to do as a team leader. Yeah, if you're if you're riding in a big grand tour or or a, or a you know or a really a, one of those top stage short stage races like week long stage race, yeah, yeah. It was the it was kind of an ugly truth, really. Yeah. It's interesting the line that Lance gives about. <laughs> EPO and its justification for it now. He says it's a safe drug taken under the guidance of a professional, taken in safe amounts. That's what he says in episode one. And when he's talking about the professional that could be involved here, it could be someone like Dr. Ferrari, for example. And that's why I kind of have a concern about us not getting the full picture in this documentary that we don't really hear much about this relationship in episode one. Hopefully it gets rectified next week. But I do wonder if there were writers, including yourself, Tyler, lower down the food chain within the U.S. Postal who perhaps didn't have the same access to Dr. Ferrari and therefore didn't have the same access to the safety of EPO, the safety that Lance sees in the drug at least? Yeah, I mean, well, I, um, uh, you know, I worked with Ferrari for a year when I was uh, kind of under Lance's wing. And uh, so, yeah, you know, um, Ferrari told me some things about, you know, EPO and all that, but, you know, a lot, I think a lot of other riders maybe who don't have the access to a top doctor like that, they don't, they don't know what the correct limits are. And yeah, that could be, EPO could be very dangerous. If they take too much of it, um, yeah, EPO can be very dangerous for sure. So if you don't have the right guidance, yeah, a product like that could be uh, incredibly dangerous, incredibly dangerous. And I, from what I've heard, like when EPO came out in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, people were taking too much of it. And they were dying in their sleep due to thick blood. You know, so, so it is, it is a bit dangerous. Absolutely. It's just interesting from my point of view that I, I just often see Lance as the kind of ideal pupil, the, the, the best in class when it came to Ferrari, but like it's interesting that you said that you worked for a year quite closely with him, that, that you obviously had the same access 
as Lance? Like, w w was there ever a sense that perhaps he was getting preferential treatment from the medics? I wouldn't say I had great access to him, but sure. because uh, I was teammates with Lance and because we lived in the same, you know, town there in, in France and we, and we trained together all the time, I did have access to him. I wouldn't say it was like equal. Um, I feel like Ferrari just trained me because he was trying to have, trying to get Lance to win the tour and he needed he, he knew he needed some top domestiques to be helping the guy. So, uh, you know, I think Ferrari was concerned with my, my riding my bike, me riding my bike fast, just for the purpose of Lance. You know, mm. um, I, you know, I never really felt like he cared too much about me as a person. That's for sure. You know, I felt more like just like a number. Yeah. Did he also tell you that uh, you were overweight? Did he, he pinch your midriff, as they said in the documentary last night? Yeah, it's funny. Who said that? That was, that was a great clip. Um, yeah, the first thing he ever, the first day I met him, he told me I was too fat and that I wasn't going to finish this race called Liège Passed on Liège, which is one of the hardest races in the world, one day races in the world. <clears throat> so I didn't like that. And I made sure I finished that race. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was into your, he'd just take a look at you and like give you the up and down, look you over and get, give you a couple like pinches behind the, behind the arm here, and right down the waist. Yeah. And he'd, uh, he wouldn't mince his words. Yeah. He, he seemed like a, a fairly direct guy. He like, yeah. <laughs> It, it's, I don't know, there's so many, like maybe we will get a, a few more questions to a couple of the answers that we have next week. But one of the other huge questions that we would have about Lance and the power that he wields is not only when it comes to the medical professionals in cycling, but also when it came to the political figures uh, in the cycling in the cycling world. Like, was that ever a conversation on your team bus or even at the team hotel about the UCI, about this apparent idea that the UCI were in his pocket, that Heinfeldbruggen was in his pocket? Because it certainly seems like a bit of a power trip for Lance Armstrong to be able to make that claim. You know, I think a lot of us teammates thought it, you know, but you wouldn't, you you had to be careful if you spoke about it because, you know, if that gets, you didn't want to, you know, piss off the general, really. So um, I think a lot of us thought, yeah, he's got the uh, president of the, UCI, Hein Verbruggen, in, the, in his back pocket, you know. I sometimes would finish a race and he'd run right after the race would be in the team bus and he'd pick up his phone and call Hein Verbruggen in front of all the, the whole team and, you know, speak to him about something. Maybe it was something that happened in the race, but he was, you know, complaining about something and this needs to be done or that needs to be done. And yeah, I found that pretty interesting. But yeah, I mean, I'd be scared to talk. I mean, I might have talked about it with my you know, wife at the time, Haven, got behind closed doors, but I'd be scared to talk about it with another teammate in fear of, you know, Lance finding out and getting pissed, you know. You had to kind of tread lightly around Lance during, during that, you know, when you're teammates with him, you know. Because when you're on his good side, everything was pretty good, but you know, when you got on his bad side, it, got, it could get ugly quickly, you know, and, um, I, fe I certainly feared that. Yeah. Could you get out of his doghouse if you were in it? What, what could you do to get out of it? Change teams. Change teams. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah, once you're in it, it was hard to get out of it. Hard to get out of it. I almost remember the exact moment in the 2001 season when it went bad. I was, it was like just on a training rod and I kind of gave, you know, I finally like stood up for myself. And, Ever since that moment, like it, our our uh, relationship changed a little bit, and, and he never really looked at me the same. And like I just gave it back to him, and yeah, me, you know, it was probably all for the good, for sure, because that led to me eventually, you know, changing teams. And, yeah. What happened? What like how did you give it back to him? Just verbally on a on a training ride? <laughs> Yeah, it was something silly about like some, you know, he was new to Girona. He, he in the 2001 season, he moved to Girona from uh, Nice, France to uh, Girona, Spain. And I, I've been riding there for years and I don't know, something about the roads. And he was always questioning about what road is this and what road's that. I'm like, trust me, Lance, it goes, you know, trust me, we go to here and we get to the climb here. And, da, da, da. 
And I think I just snapped back at him one time. It was too much for him. I just felt that. I don't know. Who knows? He probably doesn't even remember it. Uh, it's in his book. What are you talking about? It's in. He's got a little black book written down. Tyler oh, yeah. said we can't go on this road. X. Big X. Yes. Underscore. That's it. Hamilton's out. He's out. No, but Did it felt want- like that. It did feel like that a little bit. But it's all right. You, you watched the Jordan documentary. You know, I haven't yet. I've seen a few little clips of it, but I'm super excited to watch it. I think I might, you know, binge watch it in a couple, like, um, couple tries. It looks there's awesome. There's awesome. a bit where there's a bit where Steve Kerr, the Warriors coach, punches and gets punched by Jordan, and Jordan feels really small after it because you know I just punched the smallest guy in the team in the mouth. What was I doing? I'm Michael Jordan. He's just he's just a you know he's smaller than me. I, I shouldn't have the and so there's at least a humanity behind Michael Jordan. I suspect that behind those dark eyes, there's nothing in Lance Armstrong. There's nothing except the desire to crush more and win more. And that what we're all doing as part of watching this documentary is being sucked back in slowly into the black hole of his personality. And this is the, the Lance for president, the, the guy with the graffiti on his back in France in 99. I'm like, he still thinks he can be the president of the United States in his head. He thinks, I'll do this, I'll keep my podcast going, I'll start donating to one of the parties. I'm like, why not? You know, stranger things have happened in American politics. I I don't think he's changed at all. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how much he's changed. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's, I think it's impossible not to, to change at all after everything he's been through. But I mean, he's still, um, I think he still likes the limelight for sure. You know, I think he thinks he belongs there. You know, each to their own, each to their own. I prefer a kind of a, more of a quiet life. But yeah, I don't know, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, far, I'm pretty far removed from Lance Armstrong and his, his world, but, um, but yeah, every once in a while I get pulled back into it. I call it the gift that keeps on giving, you know? <laughs> and, you know, here I am talking to you guys about Lance Armstrong from whatever, 20 years ago, yeah. When was the last time you spoke to him, Tyler? Um, the last time. Uh, was it in a deposition? In a deposition. Okay. Yeah. It was here in Missoula. I live in Missoula, Montana. And uh, he had to come. It was for that, what was it? The Floyd Landis U.S. government versus Lance Armstrong trial. So I had to sit in a conference room with him for like seven, six, five hours, maybe. Yeah. But it was just... Uh, Small talk, uh, a little bit of small talk. That's it. Before that, it was the uh, Aspen, the Aspen event where he threatened me. Hmm. Did you ever feel you were his friend? I thought it was. Yeah, I did. Yeah, there's. Yeah, um, we roomed a lot in in, uh, in his comeback year, 1998. We were roommates a lot at races and training camps. And, yeah, I thought we became friends. I was a good listener, and I, you know, I think he had a lot of worries and concerns about his comeback and all that. And you know, I, I'd listen to him and try to give him some advice. I don't know. Yeah, I'd I'd say some of those years were, those were probably my favorite years with Lance. Probably the you know before he won the tour. You know, the build up to that. You know, winning. He talked about it last night. Winning the tour of Luxembourg, which at the time, you know. Or, or now it seems like nothing, but at the time it was huge, huge, huge. Like a big, big win for him. And I remember being on that team, helping him, you know, riding, riding as a top domestique and, and uh, helping him solidify that victory. That was pretty cool. But those were the fun years. You know, I mean, for me, looking back at my career, the fun, the fun stuff is the climb up, the climb up. That was, that was the greatest, surprising people and, you know, once I took that little red testosterone pill in 97, it was, you know, it changed. It changed for sure. And then just one other question on that friendship point with Lance. I guess if he is a tyrant, if he likes to dish out abuse to his teammates on a constant basis, that relationship sort of incentivizes you wanting to impress him, to please him. Like, what is it like being a friend of Lance Armstrong? There, there must have been some sort of buzz when you were on his good side as well, Tyler, as horrible as he would have been to all of you, his U.S. postal teammates, at the worst times. 
Um, yeah, yeah, being as, I mean, you were, I felt like I was always kind of on my tiptoes around him, you know, treading a little bit lightly, being, you had to be careful with your words and actions and all that, um, in fear of pissing him off. But yeah, I mean, he, he, he at times, he could carry you, you know, um, if you were, you know, in his corner. Um, but, but that relationship to me seems stressful. I was just, you know, a true friend, you should just be able to be yourself, and be open and honest. And sometimes you say something they like, sometimes you say something they don't like, but a true friend, they accept you for who you are. With him, it was a bit different. So it was almost exhausting to be around him. Yeah. Sometimes it was nice to go to a race that he didn't go to, because then you could, you could almost relax a little bit more. You know, when he was at the race with you, it was just, you know, all hands on deck, so to speak. All hands on deck. Go on, Jer. What, what would you like to see from episode two? What, what, I mean, the, you know, we've talked a little bit about some of the darker stuff from your perspective, obviously the, there's the constant legal battles, there's the bullying, there's um, his relationship with Floyd. What, what do you think we don't know that you'd like to see or like to see more of even? Oh man, I mean, I'd love to hear, see more of the truth, really. You know, the what's the why's the how's, all that. Just not, not to, not anything against Lance, but just for the future of cycling, for the future, for the younger generations of the sport, you know? Um, I don't think we've seen enough of the, of the past from him or from a lot of individuals, a lot of individuals. And there's so many like freaking half truths out there. So many, you know, you know, I dope from here to here and then stop and all that. You know, there's a lot of that. And it's just like, you know, oh, just this, that's it. And just not coming forward with the, with, you know, some of these secrets that could make a big difference. And because this, those secrets haven't come out, you know, it's this, um, you know, some, some, uh, it's hard to, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think we need more of the details from, from all of this, not only from Lance, from a lot of these individuals, you know, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Hopefully we don't see anything like this ever again, but, if we don't get, if we don't find out what happened in the past, how it happened, and how we can avoid it happening again, then it's going to happen again. Like, let's just wait. Like, just start your stopwatch, you know. And like, I don't want to have all this happen to me and to Lance and to George, all of us, you know. I mean, in a way, like, yeah, were a lot of other teams jumping? Yes. Were did a lot of other teams get caught? No. You know, have we been kind of put on on a but justifiably so. Have we kind of had to had to speak for our whole generation of cyclists? Yeah, a little bit. And the generations before that too. It didn't start with Lance or start with me, you know. But we got to make sure, like, we don't we haven't gone through all this bullshit. Excuse my language for for nothing. So, in my mind, like, we gotta we gotta do a better job. We should do be doing more roundtables, right? We talked about this. When I was, what was that? A couple of years ago that I was there. Eighteen, about eight, eighteen months, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We need a round. We need roundtable type discussions, and, and um, I don't know. I don't see it. I don't feel it. You know. I hope the sport's in a good place now. I hope, and, and, and I hope it's heading in the right direction. But you know, I don't know. I'm pretty far removed. I'm, you know, when you do tell the whole truth like that, I mean, the, there's some consequences. There are. You know, there's plenty of consequences of telling a half truth because you know maybe you can keep your job or maybe you can stay in the sport. But when you tell the full truth, like me, you're out. You're out. You know, you could say I spat in the soup. I guess. You know, I heard that term the other day, and I'm like, maybe that's me. You know, but you pay a price. You pay a price. You know, I'm far removed from the sport of cycling. You know, I have a small little coaching business. I coach weekend warrior type riders, but it's um, you know I don't deal with in the pros anymore. I don't really know what's going on in there, but but I have the truth, and I can look in the mirror every day and know that I'm like on the right path. And you know, there's there's um, yeah, there's something to be said for that. That's for sure. And, you know, moving forward in my life, it feels a lot better. And I, I know I don't have to like 
lie to back up another lie to back up another lie or like, you know, convince myself of this story. And I used to do that. I used to do all that, you know, and it's exhausting. It, it ate me up from the inside out, really. So I feel lucky. I feel lucky. I mean, once in a while, I got to talk about it and stuff like that. And it brings up all these old emotions. But, you know, for the most part, yeah, I'm moving forward. And, you know, I care about cycling and all that. But, I, you know, what happens at the, at, at, at the elite level, I, you know, I hope, hope they're doing the right thing today. You know, they're catching some people once in a while, which, you know, I don't like to see. But, you know, I feel like it's, it is getting better. But it could could be, um, I'd say, a lot better had we known if we knew some of the truth from the past. You know, maybe we could get rid of some of these um, people that aren't good for the sport of cycling, but are still involved in the sport today. Yeah, I don't know. That was great. I, I'm one last question. Would you like to be involved in the elite end of it? You know, because the spitting in the soup thing, that's what they said about Paul Kimmage. And, um, you know, he still is working through the consequences of that. Uh, yeah, you know, I might have to, I might be working through the consequences for, for the rest of my life, really. I mean, I get, you know, the Omerta still exists, for sure. I get, I mean, I, I don't feel on a daily basis, but I feel it certainly throughout the year, at least. It depends. But, you know, some, yeah. Some of the individuals I used to race against are now in the sport and they don't like me. They don't like me. They don't like that I told the truth, you know. And yeah, they make me pay for it. Let's just put it that way. You know, getting dis I've been getting I've gotten disinvited to charity events and stuff like that because of what I did. You know. Mm. Yeah. Say la vie, say la vie. But I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, you know, I mean I'd obviously change some things from my past, but I wouldn't like, I, I'm glad I told the truth. I'm glad I told the whole truth. I don't know. I do feel like I made a difference with some of the, the younger generation, maybe not the, you know, people my age or maybe the generation behind me, but I know that with the younger, younger generation, it's made a difference. And I speak to a lot of schools and yeah, I talk to kids about, you know, the consequences you make when you make a poor choice like I made. You know, and once you go down that rabbit hole, it's it's hard to get out. When you say you're being dissed and you're still feeling those consequences, are they modern examples? Because I know in your book, obviously, you write about at the end of your career when Lance was still a palatable figure around the sport, that would naturally happen to you. Is that still right. happening up, up until this day where you're still feeling the cold shoulder? Yeah, yeah. Once in a while, once in a while. Yeah. I mean, I... I don't expect it every time, but um, but I'm uh, yeah. Once in a while, I'm surprised. Like, oh, here we go, here we go again. Oh, I oh, thought that's that, of things. So, yeah, being disinvited to certain events, like after I'm you know scheduled to be there, like last minute things, and then you know, I do have some friends here. You know, there are a lot of people that have forgiven me and, and appreciate what I did. So I do get feedback from people. You know, and. I, I, get, I guess I have a sense of who my friends are and who my enemies are. So, you know, typically when something like that happens, you hear who, who made that call. You know, Omeritus fault is still, I wouldn't say it's as strong as it was back when I was racing, but the Omeritus still exists. People are still pissed that I, you know, came out with the truth. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is? Considering you have paid the consequence to titles have been stripped uh, Lance has faced a pretty hefty case you could say that when it comes to your US postal team an element of justice has been done yeah absolutely absolutely um, yeah people don't you know it, it probably hurt the sport of cycling uh, probably made a lot of other people have to answer a lot of questions or get asked a lot of questions that they probably didn't like you know I mean the the generation I wrote, wrote in, you know, in the you know, mid to late 90s through the early 2000s, it was so dirty. It was so rampant, so rampant. My first tour in 97, you know, 200 starters, I'd be surprised if five were clean. So, you know, there's so many stories, so many stories. And, you know, by me telling the truth, maybe it forced others to at least get asked those hard questions. And, you know, it's... Um, it's not always pleasant. Some people, I think, and, and, you know, it could have been me. You know, if, what if I, ex 
what if I made it through totally unscathed and somebody else had to tell the truth? I might, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I understand, but you know, it's, um, yeah, the, the truth is the most important thing. And we need to, it, sometimes it takes time to accept that. But, um, and maybe some of these individuals, it's gonna take another 10 years. You know, the truth, the, you know, this truth was ugly. This, the truth in the professional cycling in the late 90s, early 2000s was ugly. So, you know, it took me a while to come to terms with the whole truth and really tell the whole truth. And maybe some of these other individuals, it'll take them some time too. I don't know. Just one final question for me, Tyler. When you say you want to hear more about the why when it comes to Lance in episode two of this documentary, if you could turn back the clocks and put yourself in Maria, Marina Zinovich's position and ask Lance those why questions, what are those questions that you're asking? Yeah, who introduced you to it? When? Uh, when, where? You know, who else was involved? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd just go deep, I'd go deep, and, you know, um, who was complicit with this, you know, and I'm not saying everybody has to pay the price and be suspended for four years or two years, anything like that, and, you know, maybe there needs to be, remember way back when they were trying to do a truth and reconciliation thing where uh, possibly people could come in and tell the truth and maybe not serve a penalty or you know, thing like that. Yeah. Uh, and then that, that kind of mysteriously just went away. And I think a lot of people got really nervous, but I think that would be a great idea. You know, um, tell the truth. You're not gonna, you know, uh, you can come voluntarily tell the truth. You're not gonna serve any suspension or anything like that. But we do, for the future of the sport, we need the truth and we appreciate your um, support. You know, maybe you don't full, tell the full gamut like I did, but maybe you come in and tell a few secrets, you know? I think we could learn a few things and um, and help the future generations avoid all that stuff. I know, I know, riders these days nobody wants to dope. That's for sure. Nobody wants to dope, you know. And they're working their tails off out there. But if they know, maybe their competition's doping. Maybe they, you know, go into that gray gray zone a little bit. And, you know, you know how that goes. I hope that some of that comes through in the in the next um, part of the documentary. Todd, you've been really generous with your time, and um, you know I, I I hope you're right. I hope loads more people come forward and tell the truth. And I know it's been difficult to get to the point where you're comfortable talking about it, and it does bring up all these emotions. But it's yeah. really been worthwhile because if if we didn't have your testimony, we didn't have your story, we wouldn't know the truth. We'd we'd have suspected the truth, but yeah. we'd never have got to the to the details of like I think the blood bags and the blood leaking, like that's the type of stuff that really resonates with people because they can see it in their mind's eye. And when people imagine things and, and actually put themselves in a room, it, it changes their perception of the story to a point where it becomes in, entirely credible. And you begin to understand the full scale of what Lance did to his sport and why you coming forward is so important. That's, that, I look, I think you've done your sport a service. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, man, I made a lot of mistakes. I made a ton of mistakes, but, um, you know, hopefully I can make, I just don't want to see somebody go through what I went through or what Lance went through happen again, really. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a sad story, really. You know, you aspire to, you know, be at the top of your game your whole life. I don't know. I aspired to be an athlete my whole life. I didn't know what it was going to be. I, when I was a kid, I was hoping to play for the Boston Red Sox, you know, short stop. You know, then I was hoping to be a downhill ski racer. And then, you know, for whatever reason, it turned out to be cycling. And I wanted to be in the Olympics. And then you get there and, you know, it's all, um, it's all a bit of a farce, you know, a bit. You know, I worked my tail off. I was a good athlete for sure. But when you got up to that highest level, it, um, there was a lot of things undercover. And, there was deceit, there was deception, it was ugly, you know, and it made it not much fun, you know. Yeah, so uh, I don't know. Hopefully I'm making a difference, you guys. I think it's important what you guys are doing and talking about it. I appreciate that, you know. 
maybe someday we should do a round table. We'll invite some other athletes to come on, you know? I, I, I'm sure I could get a handful to come on. Well, we should absolutely do that because there are uh, a heap of other questions we have here as well, Tyler, that we don't nearly have the, the time to do. But maybe in a, a short period of time, considering everybody's on lockdown, everybody's got all the time in the world, perhaps yeah. after this documentary ends and the, the Lance uh, fog cools down a little bit, we can do that conversation. But I appreciate how difficult it has been for you to kind of evoke some of these memories again. And thank you so much for coming on the show again. Tyler Hamilton, cheers. Hey, nice to see you guys. Thanks so much. I appreciate your time.